Great. So thank you everyone. So we, we are very pleased with today's program, very rich program, even with uh, extra guests, with a lot of very, uh, very important extra guests. So we start with uh, Amory Fernandez, the international director of our university. Please, Amory. Well, I don't talk very well in English, but I make a course to talk a little bit words in here. It's a pleasure receiving in our university. Laura Brings, Eric Foston, Foston, yeah, it's right, Eric. And we wait. Oh, everything is okay in that activity and I'd like to say welcome for our university. It's a, it's a, a little bit hard to me talking English for the morning. The brain it's not very well on the morning. I am a night a night being in the morning that my brain is not function, total function. And I ask I apologize to talk a little bit in Portuguese. É, meu inglês não é muito bom, como vocês viram. É, eu tenho uma compreensão boa do idioma, mas para falar eu preciso traduzir. Pela manhã, como eu estava tentando dizer, meu cérebro ainda não funcionou apesar das duas doses de café. É, eu tive um Tenho hábitos noturnos, então eu começo a ficar operacional mesmo mais tarde. É, eu gostaria de agradecer a Stefanella o convite para fazer essa pequena abertura. Desejar a todos um bom encontro, bem produtivo. E espero que né, possamos fazê-lo outras vezes. Um abraço a todos. Obrigadíssima. Thank you, Amory. So, Kevin... The floor is yours. Bom dia a todos. Eu entendo muito bem o problema do uh, amor hoje por uh, falta de cafezinho. Eu preciso de cafezinho também antes de falar em português. But I'm going to speak in English this morning. Um, my, good morning. My name is Kevin Brosnahan. I'm the Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Consulate General here in Rio de Janeiro. It's a pleasure for us to be here this morning to support this event with two American experts uh, participating today. And I want to thank um, UFRJ, the, the Federal University of Rio, and Dr. Dr. Stefanella Boato for the invitation and for pulling this, organ, uh, this event together. Um, scientific collaboration is a priority for the US mission in Brazil. And this type of co collaboration of sharing experiences brings benefits to both of our countries. Obviously, Brazilian um, scientists and researchers and engineers and mathematicians bring a lot to both uh, biomath and the studies of uh, in epidemiology and pandemics. Two years ago, the U.S. Con it, it, time flies, I think. Two years ago, uh, the consulate had the, the pleasure of working with, um, with Dr. Stefanella and UFR Jota on the first <laughs> meeting of Fluminense Women in Biomath. Though I think this, the, the name sounds much better in Portuguese. O, encontro, o primeiro encontro fluminense de mulheres em biomatemática. For that event, the consulate had the pleasure of bringing American researchers and scholars to participate in the event, inclu including Dr. Laura Billings. So that meeting was uh, uh, the, obviously the start of a great relationship, and we're really lucky to have uh, this collaboration continuing with uh, Dr. Billings returning virtually to Rio today. Dr. Laura Billings is the Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics and Professor of Applied Mathematics at Montclair State University in New Jersey, the state of New Jersey. That's my home state, so I'm double proud. Um, she's the first woman to hold the position of Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics in the U university's 110 year history. Uh, Dr. Billings holds a PhD in applied math from the University of Colorado, Boulder, and a BS in mathematics from Lafayette College. Uh, Dr. Billings also works to promote diversity in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, 
and she continues to incorporate students in her research at both undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, she's joined today by Dr. Eric Forgeston, who is the chairperson of Applied Mathematics and Statistics at Montclair State University. His specialties include applied mathematics, deterministic and sto stochastic dy dynamical systems, mathematical biology, mathematical epidemiology, and fluid mechanics. And I have to say that I'm very happy that I didn't just have to say both of your bios in Portuguese because there's some, some uh, challenging words there. But it is a pleasure to, to welcome you both to Rio de Janeiro virtually and Dr. Billings to welcome you back. And I wish you all a successful event. And we hope that the relationships like this and scientific collaboration, even in the, the time of a pandemic and COVID-19 can continue through forms like this. And we hope someday when we all resume uh, meetings in person to welcome you back to Rio de Janeiro in person. Thank you very much. Good luck with the event today. Thank you, Kevin, it was great. So now we have uh, Nelson Maculan uh, giving some words. Uh, Nelson was a emeritus professor, but it is many things. Uh, uh, is a long list of achievements. Uh, he was also the president of our university in the past. He was the first head of our applied math department. He was secretary uh, of education, and he's professor of many uh, emeritus professor of many university. And so, Nelson, please. Thank, thank you. Stefanella, it was a great. Oh, so, so, one second. So, one second, Nelson. Something happened on my, on my. One second here. Something happened here. One second. Yes. Um, Stefanella, I, I think it's just his mic. It's, it's no, no, no. It's me. It's me. It's me. Nelson, try again. I'm sorry. Try to unmute. It's okay now? Okay, it's, it's my fault, sorry. See, go ahead. I will this mean, okay? Yes, yes, it's my fault, sorry. Oh, okay. it, it is with great satisfaction that I will call professors Laura Billings and Eric Forgoston from Montclair State University, who will teach this mini course, very important one. On behalf of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, I would like to thank the availability of these two important professors. We shall continue to maintain scientific cooperation relations between our two universities. By the way, I have a son who lives with his family in Bloomfield, near your university. On my next visit to my son, I would like to visit you both at your university. I would also like to thank our colleague, Professor Stefanella Boato, for always ensuring great international visibility for the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nelson, for the kind words. Very nice. And now, Eric and Laura, who will go first? Uh, now, Laura is mute. <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, now we can hear you. Okay, great. First, I wanted to, to thank everybody. Um, Omri, Kevin, um, Nelson, it's nice to meet you. Um, and yes, if you come to New Jersey, we would happily have you uh, be our guest. Uh, it's, we're about 20 miles from New York City, um, which is good and bad in some ways, <laughs> but we do love it here. And uh, we are so happy to have be part of, of this seminar. Um, Eric and I have been working together for a long time on epidemiology and mathematical modeling. And I would like to have him start off this, this wonderful overview, uh, talking a little bit about the outline of, of what we're going to talk about today. So let me quickly share my screen so he can have his slide and away we go. Yes, thank you, Stefanella, for this great opportunity uh, to, for Laura and I to share some of our work and, and thank you to uh, Kevin and Amory and Nelson for the very kind introductions. Um, so, so today, Laura and I uh, will be providing <clears throat> an overview talk in two parts about uh, epidemic <clears throat> modeling. And uh, each part um, is, is focused in a different way um, on the modeling side and also has a different application. Uh, so in the first part, 
it will be deterministic compartmental modeling. This is the uh, very classical type of epidemic modeling that goes all the way back to the early 1900s with Kermack and McKendrick and their first so-called SIR compartment model. Um, and Laura will provide an introduction to um, SARS-CoV-2 virus as well as the COVID-19 ap uh, epidemic, pandemic. Um, and then uh, we'll develop a, a new type of deterministic compartment model uh, with age and social contact structure that was built specifically for COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a general model, but we will perform an exploration uh, of different control strategies focusing on uh, our state in the United States of New Jersey. Uh, after that first part, we'll move to the second part, which is also epidemic modeling, but this is stochastic modeling. And there, there'll be an introduction to Ebola virus disease. And in this, uh, stochastic modeling is really performed for a variety of reasons, but one uh, aspect that we have focused on a lot over the past decade has been looking at <clears throat> rare events that are induced because of the noise or the stochasticity in the system. Uh, in particular, a, a extinction path that is most likely to occur as well as the expected time for that extinction to happen. Okay. So let me take it over for a couple minutes. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with a lot of the data that's been coming about, about the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are gonna be a little bit uh, US centric in what we're talking about today, but uh, unfortunately I did hear on Sunday, we, the world had a, a record high of number of new cases and at the top of the leaderboard was US and I think I'm not sure if it was India or Brazil were close second, uh, but that's the top three. So I feel that we we're very connected in a way and our, our how we want to, to do things uh, to make it better and to understand what's going on around us. So if you go to the CDC site on the US um, website, the government sites, uh, they provide lots of data and it's very difficult to understand the entire story by staring at some just one piece of data at a time. And you have to take them all together uh, to really understand what's going on here. So you can see the US is a, a fairly large uh, you know, spread geographically, and that the different parts of the country are going through different things at the same time. And, and while they say that there's been 6 million cases, it's been a very long journey since March. Uh, you can see that we've also had a large number of deaths uh, from the disease. And what we do know for certain is that the total cases that are, I've listed here are probably underreported <laughs> because there are so many asymptomatics. And we also know that you know, the death number is also uncertain in many ways. Some things can be attributed to the disease that weren't really its fault and, and vice versa. We could be missing others. So data is, is giving us a temperature in a sense of, of what's going on and we try to watch trend lines. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the different parts of the country are going through different things and uh, we're watching a wave in a sense. So moving along from this, we have uh, what I call time series. You can see from January 22nd on the bottom left here through September 6th, I just grabbed this this past weekend, I'm trying to get ready for the talk. And these are the number of, of cases in the US. And you can see that there's, this is the beginning of March when we had our original outbreak here in the US. And then the red line is the seven day average. And you can see the trend that we actually uh, hit this a little bit after um, maybe the second or third week of April, we hit our max and then it started going down. And then of course in June, we started an uptick again. Um, and even if you look at right now, we are still higher than we were back in March. Uh, over the last uh, past week or so, they're getting 40,000 cases per day. Um, and, and we've learned a lot from that data. We can actually measure things such as, um, at first they didn't know how many asymptomatics there were. Now they're estimating, the original estimates were 80%, which is, which is pretty scary. Uh, now they, they're thinking it's more like 40%. This is the CDC number. Um, I have the site down at the bottom there. If you wanna go look at the data yourself, um, they keep, uh, you know, putting these uh, new numbers out every week. But um, what's interesting to me is that the asymptomatic people are actually 75% um, 
uh, less likely. So 75% of the transmission rate of a symptomatic person. And that comes straight forward from the fact that a symptomatic person is sneezing, okay? <laughs> and it's just getting out there in the air. A symptomatic person wanders along and, and does their own thing without some of those explosive types of uh, transmission events. Um, but you know, that's a simple way to think about it. But uh, so we still have to be very serious about our asymptomatics. But let's look a little bit deeper into this uh, these time series data. So while we had those two outbreaks, what had happened was there was an initial outbreak on the East Coast, uh, New York, New Jersey, um, some of the more Eastern Coast states. And you can see New Jersey in particular there uh, at the top uh, around April 6th, it says here on the little tick mark, but the beginning of April, that's where we had our, our, our outbreak uh, max. And and it's that standard kind of Gaussian look of up and then down, okay? <laughs> and so you can see that that's what's going on in the beginning here. That's when the East Coast was going through when you're looking at the entire US data. But then what happened was um, it went away for a little while. People started opening up and, and guess what? There was another outbreak that spread through some of the more Southern and, and Southwestern states. Uh, this includes Florida, Texas, California. And, and that's what was going on here after at the end of June, beginning of July. And that's this outbreak uh, peak right here. And you can see how Florida is representative of one of these states that had that issue. So again, when you look at one conglomerate of data, it doesn't tell the whole story. You have to sometimes break it down into pieces. And of course, when you're modeling, it's very important to understand what is the question. So back to the original you know, reasons for doing this modeling, we wanted to predict in a sense and get ready. And, and we were very worried about the crush on the healthcare systems. And since we have been able to get a lot of data, uh, the CDC also has been providing some things about the number of days from symptom onset to hospitalization. So for example, you can see somewhere um, between three and, and nine days in general, uh, you can expect that if it's gonna get bad, it's gonna get bad in a week, how's that? Um, but what's much more important here is that we in the very beginning felt that people who are under 50, so the, the 18 to 49 years group, um, really didn't get it and they didn't get that sick and all this fun stuff and, and it's not true. It actually is serious that, uh, so it says here that not only can 18 to 49 years old people go to the hospital, but uh, they actually can even go, the ones that do go to the hospital actually can be admitted to the ICU and then they can, they get uh, these other, uh, I wanna say statistics about percentages of these different age groups that are getting um, ventilation. And then unfortunately it's the mortality rate here at the bottom that's very upsetting. And the part that really got people alarmed was the fact that uh, twenty eight percent of the people that were hospitalized that were over sixty five years old um, were were uh, we would die and um, and this is why people are taking this thing so darn seriously so if we want to move on um, so as of last week we were doing much better here in New Jersey and New York uh, the New York Times has a website uh, every uh, week that you or every day I should be honest with you about um, and you can see how the different states are doing. Um, so if you're particularly interested in a state like Texas or Florida, you can log in and you can click on the number of cases and then it'll officially tell you how the state is doing. Are you high and the cases are still high or the cases are high, but they're dropping. And in this case here, they, they said that uh, these are the states that where the case, new cases are lower and staying low. But unfortunately, yesterday we were just bumped up to the increasing again, and that's because people are partying. We have a holiday called Labor Day. It was about two weeks ago now, and or a week and a half ago, I should say. And, and people got together, did the social thing, and the disease started spreading again. And that compounded with our K through 12 schools opening again. So we have a small uptick and we are being vigilant about that and making sure to get the word out that we have to keep social distancing and washing our hands and all that. Um, but yeah, so we are keeping an eye on this. And then of course, when the cases do occur, it's very important to contact trace to make sure that we don't have too much what we're calling community spread. That's person to person in a group as opposed to things being uh, introduced from afar. Alrighty, so we have, whoops, wrong way. There we go. So let's do a quick overview of what we know about the coronavirus. Um, this is an RNA virus that causes respiratory and intestinal infections in animals and humans. Uh, coronaviruses are not new by any means, um, but and the infections occur frequently in humans and mostly cause the mild disease, 
including the common cold. So people think about the common cold and at first were very worried that it was going to uh, genetically change so quickly that we couldn't actually find a, a vaccine, but uh, luckily we're, we found that that's not true. Um, so the uh, exceptions to that common cold kind of idea have been these more severe cases um, or severe uh, examples. The first time we saw SARS-CoV uh, was back in uh, 2002, and luckily it was uh, stomped out back then. Um, and even though that there were some um, cases, uh, it wasn't really the global outbreak that we're seeing right now. Uh, there was the MERS-CoV version as well and Saudi Arabia again so virulent it kind of kept to itself in that area and um, you know, th it has gotten out a little bit but again not like we're seeing right now and of course now we're dealing with the COVID-19 which likely jumped from bats uh, to this an intermediate host to humans and we'll talk a little bit about that right now. So it's a zoonotic disease. Uh, some of these uh, reservoirs, such as bats, uh, can have lots and lots of these types of diseases, and it's a major event when one of them jumps. So the, the story is that it possibly jumped from a bat to a pangolin, I think, and uh, that was the intermediary host, and uh, then it jumped to a human. And so we know that the transmission mode for this disease is respiratory, uh, direct contact with droplets. Uh, that is the major way it's transmitted from human to human. And, and the reason why it's really that infectious is because the ACE2 receptors are not only in the respiratory tract, but in the lungs, uh, the kidney, uh, kidneys, and the gastrointestinal tract. So if this gets into your body, there's lots of places where it to hang on to and then start to replicate, and that's a, a big problem. Uh, there's also the fact that there's, as I mentioned before, asymptomatic spreaders. So there are ways for it to spread that are different than me sneezing on you or coughing. And so there's the, the point here is the fact that just breathing and they're talking a lot about that. I, I visualize it kind of as a, a smoke cloud and uh, maybe that's a way for people to understand why it's so important to have that fresh air and ventilation in general to, to reduce the density of those particles. Um, population, our population has absolutely no immunity because when this was introduced, I mean, you are literally dropping this little, this one case into an entire sea of people who can get it. And that's what's a very interesting dynamic. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we model that and think about it in a minute. Um, so because it's a brand new type of disease, we don't have any sort of memory response. For example, with the flu, as you go from year to year, it changes a little bit, and then you can actually have uh, the, co the immunity uh, from possibly catching it the year before. So uh, we had no previous exposure to this one, and so therefore, not only was it dropped into a population with no immunity, we don't even have any, the body doesn't even know what to do it. And so you get these cytokine storms and these overreactions by your body, it's a big problem. And then again, the spread from person to person is, is quite dramatic. Um, so everyone is supposed to say that's the social distancing definition about six feet, or as you guys say, possibly 1.8 meters. I'm pretty sure you're on that system. Um, <laughs> so the respiratory droplets um, in a, a diameter, there's a paper out and I, I think it's, uh, gosh, is it JAMA? Um, that talks a little bit about the percentages of the chances of you catching the disease for the different distances and it drops by half once you, and it's actually quite low, less than 1% once you get to that six feet. And, um, and so respiratory pathogens spread like this um, in general, flu, these other things. And so this is by, by no means any different. So you can see here a quick picture of how the disease uh, spreads, as I said before, it could be just expiration, the breathing part of it as well. It doesn't have to be uh, sneezing and coughing, but a lot of people um, say that that's a, a major spreading uh, way it happens in the very beginning from a symptomatic person. And that respiratory droplets, okay, they, they attach onto things and, and they you know, spread through the air. Um, and then you can possibly, like I said, inhale them into the lungs and then it attaches uh, and, and it will reproduce in your body. Uh, it's currently unclear if the, the um, COVID-2 can actually spread by touching a surface. Um, that's something right now that is uh, really, it's being studied and it's, it's, there's different types of results here. So we're all being careful and washing our hands so that if we do touch something, whether it's a keyboard or a desk or a table, um, the goal is not to touch your face. But um, in general, that's, you know, the hand sanitizing is just an extra layer of protection. Um, but in the very beginning, the, the three rules, of course, was to wear your face covering, we call it. Okay, that's a mask. You have to social distance, and then you have to have good hand, hand sanitization. Uh, wash your hands. That's the point. Okay, 
Um, so now uh, my, so we want to know what's going to happen to the disease in the future. So I'm going to give a very quick and basic, quick and dirty um, model uh, description. Uh, how do we start and to, to kind of conceptualize what's going on? And the very, very simplest model is called an SIR model. The S is for susceptible, the I is for infectious, and the R usually means removed. And I can break a population up into three groups. You can be susceptible to a disease, you can actually have it and be infectious, and then you could be removed after you recovered. And the big thing here, why there's a pink bubble around the eye, is that if you want to capture the number of infectious, we can use a differential equation and a mass action term of how does one become infectious? How do we enter? You actually have a susceptible person come in contact with an infectious person at some sort of rate. We're calling it beta here. That's the infectious contact rate. And you can see the mass action term down here. So how does the infectious group change in time? T is for time, is the beta IS term. That's the mass action. And you can kind of already think about this, if there are a lot of infectious people or if there's a lot of susceptible people, if those numbers are big and you multiply them together, two big numbers give you a really big number, right? And so you can see the beta is this, this rate of the probability of this thing being transmitted. Um, and it kind of also captures how dense the, the population is in the area. So it kind of is an all capturing parameter there. Um, and then you can see how people leave, of course you get better and there's a rate at which people get better. And in general, what we've talked about is that if you've been exposed um, or even if you have it, you have to isolate for two weeks. And so this is a medically um, you know, measured parameter and it's pretty accurate in general. Um, and, and so, and of course there's outliers and all of that and this is the average, but this is something actually we can capture pretty well. So the beta is something more of an amorphous term that we have to figure out and then the gamma on the other side here, this rate of recovery is a very exact kind of parameter. And, and as I said before to you, um, the, the general profile of one of these kinds of um, events is, is this Gaussian type of curve. So let's focus on the black curve here in the middle to start with. So along the bottom here, you've got time. And then you have the um, number of cases, or in this case here, it's the number of critical beds. So this would be kind of ICU, um, intensive care unit types of, of patients in a hospital. And you would see there's a very low number, even possibly zero in the beginning. You get that spark. It's introduced to the population. You'll get this growth in the very beginning. And that's where you, of course, have lots of susceptibles, very few infectious, okay? And then the, the tables kind of turn and you get kind of an equal number of the two. And eventually you get more infectious than susceptibles and it runs out of people to infect. And then it kind of goes through this turning point and comes back down the other side. And you can see how if we slow the spread rate, okay, so this beta idea here, you can actually change the profile of that, that curve, uh, that outbreak profile. And we're very interested in that very beginning part, that exponential growth we're gonna call that. Because what you can do is you can approximate the entire population to 100%, okay? Because as I said before, everybody is susceptible pretty much, except that one guy who has it. And, and so you can make the S into a one, and therefore you get this very simple one-dimensional differential equation with just basically the spread rate. Think about this, how fast are the number of infectious going to grow? It's going to be proportional to the number of infections but then you have this beta minus gamma. So let's think about this. This is how fast does the disease spread? How many new people are getting infected compared to how many people are getting better? So of course, the more people that are getting infectious, it's a really high rate and it's increasing quickly. You're gonna see that the solution for this is that you're going to have this exponential solution, okay? And, and that, that rate right there, that difference is going to be how fast this thing goes up in the very beginning. And again, that's exponential. So we're gonna call that, okay? So we actually make a ratio out of it, beta over gamma, and that's called R0, the base of reproductive ratio. And that's the R0 or R0 if you're from Europe. Um, and you can look at that number. If it's bigger than one, you can really think about it as how many people an infectious person will infect during the period they're infectious. So if it's more than one, then it's going to spread. If it's less than one, it'll decrease. And you can see there that um, right now with no mitigation, they call it, with no measures, it's been approximated that the R0 for this disease is somewhere between two and three. And depending on the data, it's, I've seen 2.4. Now it's about 2.5. So you can, um, 
And so I just want to leave you with, oops, sorry, one more thing. Didn't mean to do that. There we go. Um, about the doubling rate. When this first out, the outbreak happened in New York City, they talked a lot about the doubling rate. And that really goes back to that exponential growth, that R0 of 2.5. They were wondering how fast is this thing doubling in time? And, and they were trying to figure out exactly what was going on with this disease. And so you can kind of see this. That's the, they tell two friends and they tell two friends and so on and so on. And once it gets that momentum and get a big enough group, it's really difficult to, to kind of contain and stop it. And that's why the US back in, in March really shut everything down. I mean, literally people were just in, locked up in their houses, barely went out to go grocery store or anything else. And, um, and it really did, that was that first um, outbreak. And then you had to come down because there just really weren't the people to spread it to. And so you can see here, they called it flattening the curve. And this was a very early study. This graph comes actually from Neil Ferguson um, in a group over in the UK. Uh, this was put out at the end of March when people were raising the flag saying, you've got to stop this exponential spread. And it made a, a real impact on people. And you can see if we did nothing, the black curve again. So that's that Gaussian you know, outbreak that, that we would predict would happen. Um, and then as you actually did things like you isolated the cases that you've discovered or you closed down the schools and the universities, uh, what you're doing is you're decreasing that beta, you're decreasing that R naught, and then therefore that beginning part here, you can see that exponential growth from the black is flattened down, 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 down. And these are all the things that we did in the US to really take that beta down to the point where we could stop the spread from that first wave. And, um, and it worked, believe it or not. Now it did all kinds of damage to our economy and everything else. And we can't keep that up because we all don't want to just live in our houses from now on. But um, as I said to you before, uh, this was the very extreme um, behavior that had to happen to flatten the curve. So beyond that, um, so let me just mention a very quick other a study that came out in May, and then we we're going to come up with something that's much more specific that, that Eric worked on. Uh, but I wanted to show you how you can take that SIR model and you can refine it into more compartments to really understand because the infectious group are working very differently. And so it turns out here that when someone is exposed exposed to the disease, they're not yet infectious. So a susceptible person comes in contact with an infectious person, there's a period of time where the disease has to kind of build up in the body before you yourself become infectious. So that's exposed and that's important, that delay when you're looking at the dynamics of a system. And then there's also, of course, you still have your infectious. So you have now an SEI. So SEIR models are often studied. This is a, um, a refinement of the SIR. That's a standard thing that epidemiologists look at. But what we did was the R part of it, we're actually going to break up into two pieces because we have the symptomatic and we have the unreported, okay? So this is the reported and the unreported cases because we did a very good job of anyone who actually was identified with the disease. We pulled them out real quick and we isolated them. We said, you stay home for two weeks. Um, and then it's the asymptomatic and the unreported that go around and infect people. So you have the, the different groups of people in there that you have um, contact rates is what I'm trying to say are, are different. So you have a, um, a bit of data also to go on now. So since we have a bit of history, uh, we can come up with what we're calling the um, cumulative reported cases. And so you can actually fit the data to make sure that the parameters make sense. And, and that's what they did in this study here by Liu and et al uh, back in May. And, and what they really saw from this, and they gathered from this, and we're not doing this usually to be uh, quantitative. We do this to be qualitative, to understand the disease. And they broke it up into what I'm calling three stages. There's, of course, that stage in the beginning where you're taking that drop, that new case, and you're wondering if it's going to take off like a forest fire. And uh, bad, bad analogy, we're dealing with lots of forest fires here in the U.S. also. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> aren't we all? But um, the idea here is that in stage one, you have this kind of a bunch of susceptibles and a possibility of an outbreak. And then in stage two, it actually starts to, to happen. You get that exponential increase. So you can see in here, you have that stage two. So this graph, again, along the bottom is time. Uh, you're looking at the reported 
the red is reported and the uh, purple is unreported cases in time. But then they've actually added two graphs or two curves on here. This is the cumulative reported and the cumulative unreported. And that's the group that we really want to get our hands around. We just don't know what the unreported people are doing. And so you can see with the reported that it's going to grow exponentially. And then what happens is you um, have that turning point that I told you about before, that whole Gaussian idea. And, and when you do that, then the, this over this turning point here, and you come down the other side, and you can see that that's when this thing starts to flatten out and possibly go completely flat again, uh, similar to what you saw back up in stage one. And that's what we grab from this, that now you're in that case again where you can have that invasion, I'm calling it. You know, you have that outbreak that happens out of almost nowhere. We have to stay vigilant to make sure that doesn't happen again. So this disease uh, data, actually, they use three different sets. Um, and one, the one I'm showing you right now is Italy. Uh, the other group that they were looking at, I think they were looking at Italy and Spain and uh, South Korea. And I'm gonna show you the South Korea bit here as well. Um, what was interesting there was that um, they, they talk about this story of, so it's very similar, um, they, they looked at the cumulative reported cases. They were staring at the unreported cases. They feel that they were down here because they were so, so thorough in their testing of the population in South Korea back then um, in, in March or so. And, and what happened was, which was interesting, was that you know they went through the turning point, they have the data that's pretty low here, and then they started to be uh, really serious about contact tracing. And this is back in the day when they talk, started talking about how important it is. If you do have a case, figure out where it came from, isolate all those people and stop that exponential spread. And they had a story of this one, I call him ambitious man, <laughs> who went around, I think it was to nine different bars on a weekend, okay? He was infectious. He was going around bar to bar to bar. He actually infected, I think, 50 people, something along that line. They actually quarantined over 200. And they said, we stopped this potential outbreak because of this one ambitious party goer. And they were very, very happy about that. And, and it's not just that, because we're dealing with this right now on our, our, seriously, our college campuses. We're looking at these small gatherings where the people are actually going out and infecting small groups. And then those groups can infect other small groups and on and on. And if we can shut it down, we can really stop it. And on a more personal note, so my kids actually even went back to school at the beginning of last week. And of course they had one case and they said, hmm, where'd this come from? Well, it turns out, this one case came from a small group of people, okay, from the high school that had a party. And it turns out that that affected um, possibly, again, that number 50 keeps coming up, but they had these uh, groups of students and now my school system is shut down for two weeks while they make sure everyone, okay, they're gonna stop this bread and they're gonna start over again in another week or so. And the kid's gonna try again to do the hybrid thing where they're staggered every other day, social distancing and all that. But they're all pretty confident that they stopped this thing in its tracks and, um, we're re really ready to go in and try it again. So the contact tracing to stop the community spread within a population that's going to be interacting is very, very important. So with that, I want to tell you a little bit about Eric's work on more of a New Jersey specific model and, and some of the refinements you can make beyond what I was talking about before with our SEIR. So take it away, Eric. Okay. So Laura's provided a very nice uh, background to epidemiological modeling uh, with the SIR and then the SEIR and, and some other refinements. So in this particular model, now we're dividing the population into seven different classes or compartments. There's the susceptible class, which is just as, as Laura had explained. Uh, these are individuals who do not have the disease but if they come into contact with an infectious individual, they may be infected with the disease. And, and then just as with the SEIR model, we have an exposed E class here. So these are individuals who now they have become infected with the disease, but they're not yet capable of infecting other susceptibles. So there's a latent or waiting period that these exposed individuals uh, have to go through before they enter an infectious class. Uh, now here, uh, unlike a standard SEI or model where there's just one infectious class, now we have two different infectious classes. And that's, and that's because of the specificity of this particular uh, disease, SARS-CoV-2, uh, where so many infectious individuals aren't showing symptoms. They're asymptomatic. 
And, and so an exposed individual can go into one of two infectious classes. They're either in the asymptomatic infectious class, not showing symptoms, or they move to the symptomatic infectious class where they do show symptoms. Asymptomatic infectious individuals, they will be infectious for some period of time, just as in the, the SIR model that Laura described. And after that period of time, they will move to the recovered class uh, as shown by, by the arrow at the top there. Symptomatic infectious individuals have a variety of, of outcomes. Some of them will recover after some period of time and they will move to the recovered classes, but others uh, will end up going to the hospital and yet uh, others uh, unfortunately will end up dying because of the disease. Those that end up in the hospital have two possible outcomes. So some of those hospitalized individuals will then recover and move into that compartment and others, uh, unfortunately, again, will end up in the deceased class. Laura, could you change? Thanks. Uh, so, so that's the schematic of, of the model. And, and now let's develop uh, sort of in full detail the governing equations uh, that we're going to have to solve as, you know, to, to see the results of different uh, modeling uh, strategies and scenarios. Uh, so one thing, um, if you just look at these uh, SE, ISIA, HRD equations, there's seven equations, one for each of the classes. Uh, but for this particular disease, uh, as Laura pointed out early on, uh, there is a large discrepancy in the outcomes of infectiousness and hospitalization rates and death rates, depending on how old you are. And because of that great disparity across age classes, uh, we've divided uh, the model, <clears throat> uh, not just seven compartments, but within each compartment, we've divided into 17 different age groups. Uh, so each age group is five years, zero to five, five to 10 years, 10 to 15 years, and so on, all the way to 75 to 80 years. And then the 17th class is 80 and, and beyond, everyone else uh, 80 plus. Uh, so uh, there's actually not seven uh, differential equations that we're solving. It's, it's 17 times seven. Uh, so it's, uh, that's a lot of equations to solve. That's over it's 109 equations. Um, so I'll, I'll do just exactly what Laura had done uh, and step through these equations, starting with the top one. Uh, we have S dot. The dot is derivative with respect to time. So that's the change of susceptibles in time. And it's uh, this lambda is the force of infection times the susceptibles. That's just like the, the beta IS term that Laura had. Um, the lambda is shown at the bottom and I'll, I'll come back to that. It looks a little bit different than the beta IS and I'll explain why in a, in a moment when we get there. But that, that lambda S, that minus lambda S is, is really just like that beta IS term that, that Laura had in the SIR equations. And it's negative because these are susceptibles who have become infectious or become infected and are moving into the exposed class. And so in the second equation, we have the change of exposed in time and you get that plus lambda S term. And after some period, uh, an exposure time that's given uh, on average by one over gamma, they leave the exposed class and move into one of two infectious classes. A fraction of them, F, will move into the symptomatic class. That's that F gamma E term in the third equation. While the remainder of them, the one minus F gamma E, they become asymptomatic infectious. The, in, the, in the fourth equation, the asymptomatic uh, infection, there is uh, an infectious time uh, that on average is given by one over sigma A. That's that minus sigma A I A term. And all asymptomatic infectious individuals become recovered. So if we go to the sixth equation, the recovered equation, we see the middle term, we see the plus sigma A IA. Those are the individuals coming out of the IA infectious class. Going back to the third equation, the symptomatic infections, those individuals will reside on average in that class for one over sigma S, and they're going to three different places. So we see that some fraction of them given by H will end up in the hospital. So in the hospital class, we see H sigma S I S. Another fraction of them will end up dying. 
So that's in the deceased equation, seventh one, the D sigma S I S. And then the remainder of them, one minus H minus D will end up in the recovered class. That's the first term in the recovered equation, the one minus H minus D times sigma S I S term. And then the last thing to account for here is in the hospitalization equation, we have the alpha H, uh, capital H term. So uh, the average amount of time that an individual spends in the hospital is given by one divided by alpha H. And uh, two things uh, can happen. Uh, those individuals either recovered or some of them die. Um, the fraction of them that are die is given by DH. That's in the deceased equation. We have the DH, alpha H, capital H term. And then the remainder, one minus DH recovered. That's the last term in the recovered equation. So that's how we formulate uh, all of these um, differential equations that, that govern the dynamics of this particular model. Um, it's more complicated than SIR, but it's, it's grounded in the same type of, of theory and formulation uh, for the, the more simple SIR or SEIR type models. Um, for the force of infection lambda term, so we've added something else uh, into this model uh, that, that makes it more complicated, but also allows us to do certain things that, that I'll talk about in a moment. And that is that we have included social contact structure within this problem. And so uh, there, there were studies that were done, and I'll, I'll have a couple slides on this in a moment, but, but people uh, in eight different European countries uh, kept contact diaries. And, and day by day, they noted how many contacts they had with people in different age groups in the, work, in, in the workplace, at home, in schools, and in other types of scenarios. And so we have the, we have the actual numbers um, of contacts between different age groups. And so we've, we've built that in so that we can better understand how to control interactions uh, through this modeling framework. And so this lambda, again, is, is kind of like the, the beta i over n term from that simple SIR model. And you see in these equations, the I S over N or the I A over N. Um, so each of these summations just has to do with dealing with symptomatic infectious or asymptomatic infections. If I just look, concentrate on one of them, they're, they're very similar. Um, the, the beta term, that contact rate is really that rho times the C. The, the rho is the probability of transmission uh, so just because an infectious individual comes into contact with a susceptible, it doesn't mean that the susceptible is guaranteed to become sick. There's a probability that the disease is transmitted, and that's captured by the rho term out in front of the summation. And then, of course, the more contacts you have, then the greater uh, chance of spreading the disease. And that's the capital C uh, term. So that's the actual contacts uh, between different age groups. And, and that captures the whole force of infection or that kind of beta I S divided by N term that Laura presented in the SIR model. So talking about the social contact matrices a bit more, as I mentioned, there are these matrices, let's call them M. Um, these are just sort of raw numbers of contacts uh, that came from these studies in eight European countries. Um, uh, later, uh, just a few years ago, uh, uh, a number of uh, researchers, Prem et al., I, I should have put that citation here. Um, it's, in, it's in the paper uh, cited um, that I'll mention later. Um, but they use some statistical analysis and Monte Carlo simulations to project those contact diaries from the eight European countries to 144 other countries. And all this data is, is available and uh, since we're studying uh, New Jersey and the US, we've, we've taken the data for the US of A, um, but you could take it for any of these uh, 144 other countries. Um, each entry of the matrix M tells us, again, it's a raw number. It's a mean number of contacts who are in age group I as reported by participants in age group J. These are just the interactions that, that are happening. And this was done again for four different environments, work, school, home, and everything else. Now, <clears throat> uh, you do have to adjust these matrices for your particular population structure. Uh, and so uh, we were able to gather the empirical data for New Jersey. 
and create the population contact matrix C. That's the matrix that was in that force of infection lambda term on the previous slide. And, and once you have this, uh, then you can find the expected number of cases in age group I due to a single infectious individual in age group J. That's just rho times C. That's like that, that sort of beta term. Um, and if you want it over the entire infectious period, you just divide by sigma. So then you get this capital R term, a rho divided by sigma times the contacts. And each of these entries, each of these Rs, uh, are entries of the next generation matrix. And I won't go into the whole theory behind this, um, but the leading eigenvalue of this next generation matrix gives you the reproduction number, uh, capital R naught, uh, which Laura had mentioned as well. This, this is the thing that if it's greater than one, the disease will spread throughout the population. And if it's less than one, it will decline and decrease. And in this work, um, we captured empirically determined values of reproduction numbers. That was based on the, on the data, the number of cases, and using that empirical value coupled with our uh, models reproduction ratio uh, found using uh, rho times C divided by sigma, we were able to back out the uh, rho term, that probability that a contact results in infection. So here's just to give you a sense of what these social contact matrices look like. Um, these are the original uh, matrices uh, M, uh, again, provided for the four different environments. And, and so you can quickly see, if you look at, say, the bottom left, the school one, you see the bulk of contacts are occurring in those younger age groups, uh, you know, between, mostly between, you know, uh, zero and, and 20 to 25, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, in comparison, if you look at uh, the work matrix in the upper right, uh, you see the younger age groups and the very older age groups, those are, those are mostly white. Um, most of the contacts are happening in, in the age groups running from about 15 to 65. And, and you can see the, the type of structure in, in the home. And now you see that, that there are interactions between young kids and older individuals, their grandparents, um, with, with a lot of interactions between uh, individuals of the same age group. Uh, so this all makes sense. Um, if, you, if you were to look at it for different countries, uh, you can see some differences. So for example, uh, there are some there are some countries where uh, maybe grandparents are more likely to live uh, in a home with their grandchildren, and then you know, there will be higher levels of contacts in, in those matrices. Um, there are other countries where different types of cultural norms uh, are leading to different types of structures when we, when we look at these matrices. But these are the ones that we used. And so, so that's the, the framework for the, the modeling effort here. And now we're going to apply it to New Jersey and, and consider um, some different scenarios that, that can happen. Uh, and everything I'm going to show you, uh, our model simulations begin on March 4 of this year. And, and the reason we start on that date is that is the date that New Jersey had the first official recorded infectious individual. So if you look at the data going back, uh, you won't see any cases in New Jersey until March 4, and then there's a couple on that date, and then it grows. Now, of course, we know that, that there were you know, thousands and thousands of individuals running around infected, probably from months beforehand, but, but it's that date that, that the first officially tested and recorded individual with COVID-19 uh, was, was noted in New Jersey. So our simulations start there. And this, <clears throat> this result, um, is a situation where no lockdown measures are done. So this is not what happened in New Jersey. Uh, this, is, this is a sort of a theoretical exercise just to see what happens if you do nothing. Um, this, is, this is akin to what Sweden, for example, uh, attempted to do um, uh, with not much success um, and some, some other countries uh, maybe involuntarily um, Herd immunity usually uh, involves uh, the situation, we talk about herd immunity with vaccine. Um, how much vaccine do we need to give um, before the population is protected? Uh, but it's being thrown around throughout this pandemic 
uh, as this sort of scenario where you do nothing and just let the disease run through the population until enough people have been infected that, that some people will um, then, then have that protection, that, that herd protection. So the figure on the left shows the symptomatic infectious individuals over time, uh, starting on March 4 and running all the way out to August. The figure on the right shows the cumulative number of deaths uh, over that same time period. The colors on the main graph, these, each color is associated with a different age group. And so you see in the legend, um, the, the purple and blues and greens, these are the youngest age groups. Uh, moving into the yellows is more of the middle age groups. And then as we get to the oranges and, and then the reds, these are the oldest age groups. So in the figure on the left, we can see with the, the red and, and particularly the reds, you know, say the, the, the three darkest uh, orange and reds, they have the lowest uh, number of infectious symptomatic individuals in the population. And that's because they are the lowest fraction of the total population. Uh, there's far more young and middle-aged individuals in New Jersey than there are older people. And so they're not contributing uh, in the largest numbers to the disease. You see that the, the largest number of infected symptomatic individuals are those blues and greens. Uh, the inset is just a cumulative uh, number there. That's, that's all of the colored graphs added together into one big thing. Um, so you see if you do nothing, um, you, know, you, get a, you get one massive peak. It just, it just runs through the uh, population until virtually everyone is, is infected. Uh, there will be some susceptibles uh, remaining at the end, but, but by far, uh, most of the population of New Jersey, which is about 9 million people, will, will be infected at the end. Now, even though the oldest age groups don't contribute that much to the infectious numbers, if you look in the right at the cumulative deaths, you see here that the, that the far and away, uh, the greatest number of deaths are coming from those, those reds and oranges uh, at the top. Um, so that, that shows um, what Laura was talking about, how you had this wide disparity uh, between uh, deaths, between the young groups and the older groups. And that's being reflected in the results you see here. Um, so even though they, they, uh, there's not that many uh, infectious comparatively throughout the population, they are the groups that are really contributing uh, to the cumulative deaths. Uh, again, the inset shows uh, all of the different age groups uh, summed together as one large uh, cumulative death plot. Um, if you do nothing, that's uh, approaching about 60,000 uh, cumulative deaths just in New Jersey alone. Um, again, this is not what New Jersey did. Uh, right now, New Jersey uh, has about 16,000 uh, cumulative deaths. Um, so while well, certainly uh, a tremendous amount of death and, and far more than, than we would like to see, um, it, it's a far cry from the 60,000 uh, that the model uh, predicts. Okay, um, so moving on to some uh, different types of uh, control strategies. So, so before we did nothing in that, in that previous slide, uh, now we'd like to try something uh, and we'll go through some different scenarios. Uh, so in all of these cases, uh, we're going to, to follow exactly what New Jersey did uh, through, the, through the pandemic. Uh, again, March 4 is when our simulations start. That is uh, when the first cases officially uh, were tested and, and put on, on the, you know, the government uh, data uh, sites. Um, uh, there were no lockdown measures at that time. Uh, the disease continued to grow and grow, and there was very rapid and uh, New Jersey itself as a state uh, implemented essentially a complete lockdown on March 16. Um, uh, very few things were open at this time. Uh, there was a shelter in place order. Uh, everyone who was a non-essential worker was told to stay at home. Uh, all the schools were closed. Um, really the only things that were open were, were hospitals, supermarkets, uh, a few, um, uh, a few small businesses that, you know, the electricians and plumbers and, and uh, you know, some people that were needed for, for emergency type work in, in different environments. But, but effectively, the entire state was, was locked down. And it stayed that way for about six weeks or so uh, until um, 
because it was effective and, and the number of cases uh, had peaked and had come, come down, um, as, as we've seen in the different models is what happens, um, the state decided to begin incrementally uh, easing the restrictions and, and starts their opening. So on May 2nd, uh, state parks and golf courses were reopened. They weren't reopened completely. Uh, they were still, you're supposed to wear a mask. Uh, you had to socially distance. Um, even at places like golf courses, uh, where normally after you, you play golf, uh, you know, you go and have a beer, or so I'm told, um, you know, that was closed. Uh, you couldn't do that anymore. Um, uh, later, uh, on May 18th, uh, construction was allowed to resume and curbside deliveries uh, were allowed. So now uh, for restaurants could, could deliver food to the curbside. You just drive or walk up uh, onto the sidewalk and they bring the food uh, out or, or they, there were even some, some hardware stores and things like that that were now uh, delivering um, uh, items that people purchased online uh, outside. A few days later, beaches and lake shores were reopened. Um, and a few days after that, elective surgeries resumed. So at this point, um, th this is at the point where, um, where we did sort of all, the, all, all of our work on, on the model. Um, so although it's now been a few more months over the summer and many more things have opened up uh, over the summer, uh, that's not included uh, per se um, as, as exactly what New Jersey did in the model. So, so our models are, are, were done um, you know, May, May 26 was how we followed New Jersey's protocols. Um, and then we assumed different things as I'll show you in a moment. Um, and, and so in these different scenarios, uh, we will remove remaining lockdown measures or possibly re-implement lockdown measures in, in different ways. And I'll, I'll go through those. So here's two types of reopening scenarios. Uh, so, uh, and again, in both of these simulations, um, we followed the New Jersey protocols on, on lockdown and the partial openings, <clears throat> as I just described. Um, in the black curve that you see, and, and here we're plotting the, from top to bottom, we have asymptomatic infectious, symptomatic infectious, hospitalization, and cumulative deaths. And, and the black curve is a scenario where, um, on June 1, just a few days after, after the elective surgeries came into being on, on May 26th, on June 1, uh, everything reopens with the exception of schools, which are assumed to open on September 1. And when you do that, just a kind of a, a complete reopening essentially, really too soon, um, it's something that many states, uh, not New Jersey, but many states did do something like this um, and, then, and then we saw exactly what happened and it's, and it's predicted by the model. We get a major sort of second wave uh, a few months later. Um, and, and you see uh, at the end of it all, cumulative deaths are about 30,000 um, in this scenario. Um, and and I, should, I should note that the way we implement uh, the reopenings and, re and closings and re-implementing of, of lockdown is, is through those uh, social contact matrices, that matrix C. Uh, so when everything is open, um, we just have the full set of contacts happening as given by those matrices. Uh, if, for example, schools were entirely closed, then that social contact matrix is, there's, there's none, there's no contacts happening there. It's, it becomes a zero matrix. Uh, but if, for example, schools are reopened at half capacity, then we would use just half of the contacts in, in the normal matrix. And so we can adjust uh, these controls by adjusting the uh, numbers of contacts in those contact matrices. Um, and, and I'll note that, that there's another thing that can be adjusted if you want to, that's that row term uh, in the force of infection lambda, that's the probability of transmission. Um, you know, if you assume that everyone is wearing masks and socially distancing, then that probability of transmission will decrease. Uh, so that, that can be adjusted as well if, if you want to. Uh, so going back to this figure, um, the second scenario is, is similar. Uh, it's the blue. Uh, we have that partially reopened state as of May 26, following exactly New Jersey's protocols. And then we assume that it just remains pretty much locked down uh, all the way until August 1. 
And then everything is removed, including an early reopening of schools. And, and again, um, we see that major second wave uh, outbreak. Uh, all this really does is, is, you know, delaying the reopening just delays that second uh, major second uh, peak. Um, cumulative deaths you see is, is essentially the same. Uh, it really doesn't um, protect you in any, any way. Here's another scenario, which we call successive easing. Um, in this plot, we've got uh, all the graphs uh, together. The blue is the symptomatic infectious, the red is hospitalized, and the green is cumulative deaths. And uh, here, the assumption is that uh, from May 26th on, uh, we just assume that every 10 days, uh, there's a slow reopening of different things until by mid-August, everything is reopened, and then schools reopen on September 1. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's opening everything up pretty quickly across the summer, um, but, um, you know, but with everything being open uh, over a sort of a three-month period. So uh, not surprising, uh, just like the other two examples, you get that major uh, second wave infection, and also the, the cumulative deaths are, are approaching 30,000, just as, as with the other uh, two cases. Now, here's a scenario. I should point out that in the previous scenarios, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't based at all on doing any testing or contact tracing. It was just sort of, you know, uh, blindly, without knowing anything what was going on in, in, in the community, just reopening things, and, and you see what happened. Uh, this is predicated on uh, having a capability of performing testing and the appropriate contact tracing that goes along with with testing, telling people that they need to quarantine and, and so forth. And uh, there's a series of, of these sort of cyclical easing and lockdown uh, control strategies that we explored um, where we assumed you had different capabilities of testing and contact tracing. So the idea is that um, we start with knowing how many uh, symptomatic infectious cases we have in late May. And as the summer uh, goes on, we successively ease at intervals of 10 day periods, just like on the previous slide, but we're testing and performing contact tracing and we set a threshold. And through our testing and contact tracing, if the number of infectious individuals uh, goes beyond a threshold, then we say, okay, well, it's getting out of hand and we need to shut down something, uh, not the whole economy, but, but uh, you know, a gradual lockdown until the cases drop again, then you reopen. If you pass the threshold, you lock down uh, something again. And if you have great capability uh, so that you're looking at a 10% um, above the threshold, then you get the figure on the left. Uh, so again, plotting asymptomatic, symptomatic infectious, hospitalized, and cumulative deaths. And this is a multi-year graph. Uh, this, this graph actually goes, goes out uh, to 2026 in time. Uh, and you see, uh, you do get these, these um, multiple peaks of infection, uh, but the scale is very important here. So for example, look at the scale of the symptomatic infectious. Those peaks are about 1,000. Uh, symptomatics uh, uh, in the second uh, plot down. Um, and, and so each infectious outbreak is not particularly large and, and you catch it before it goes very big. Uh, you lock something down and, and you bring the disease uh, back down to very low levels. You reopen uh, whatever was closed down. And over time, it's not immediate, of course, uh, you will get a small outbreak, but because you're testing a lot, you know exactly what's happening in your community you're able to maintain this balance between having the economy open uh, without letting the disease uh, get completely out of hand. And under this scenario, uh, the cumulative deaths um, is, is uh, even over you know, multi-year period is, is uh, oh, it's, it's about 15 or 16,000, something, something like this. Uh, there's a table on, on the next slide that I'll show in a moment. Um, now, if your testing is, is not quite as good, um, and you're not able to, to know what's going on above your threshold, the, the 10%, but, but let's say it's 200%. Let's say you can only measure 
uh, by a factor of two uh, on that threshold, then you get the figure on the right. Um, and so, so you see here, it's if you know if you don't have good testing and contact tracing, um, you really cannot maintain the disease in check, uh, as in the in the figure on the left. Uh, here you get a, a pretty severe uh, second wave uh, and a less severe third wave, and cumulative deaths um, are are much larger. Um, maybe maybe not as bad as if you reopen everything at once, um, but but still uh, not great. And here um, is just uh, showing the, the as a way of comparison the cumulative deaths for these different scenarios. Um, as of May 22, um, in New Jersey, the Department of Health was recording just over 11,000 deaths uh, in our model um, uh, based on all of our um, parameterization with the empirical data. Uh, we're, we're showing uh, also just over 11,000 uh, deaths in late May. And under these uh, sort of theoretical uh, scenarios, uh, that first one where uh, everything opens on June 1 with schools opening in September, uh, approaching 30,000 cumulative deaths. Um, very similar result if, if you uh, stay locked down through, through June and July, but open everything uh, August 1. Uh, the successive easing where you open gradually uh, every 10 days throughout the summer, but everything including schools are open by September 1. Uh, again, very, very large number of cumulative deaths. Um, far beyond what you can do if you have great testing and contact tracing in place. That's the cyclical easing, 10%, um, about 15,000. Uh, the worse you do on testing and contact tracing, of course, uh, the worse you do in containing the epidemic. And we see that in the cumulative deaths, uh, you know, increases um, as, as, those, as their capability of, of tracking the numbers of infectious individuals uh, as it degrades and your threshold beyond threshold number increases, your cumulative deaths uh, increase uh, as well. And, and so just to conclude uh, this sort of part one, um, uh, we've got a, a deterministic epidemic uh, compartment model uh, that, was, that was developed specifically for COVID-19 and uh, employing age and contact structure in order to uh, really understand the effects of different uh, lockdown and easing strategies. Um, we, we applied the model uh, specifically to New Jersey, um, but uh, it's a very general model uh, and uh, it can be parameterized with empirical data for any region of the world. Uh, you can use the contact structures uh, from the PREM article um, for any, any uh, any one of 144 uh, countries throughout the world. Um, as we've shown, uh, in order to avoid a major second epidemic outbreak, uh, adequate testing and contact tracing and the isolation and quarantine that goes along with, with those strategies uh, must be done. Um, if you don't know what's going on in your community, uh, you really have no way of controlling the disease. Um, and I didn't show it uh, in the results, but in the paper, um, we also looked at uh, what if New Jersey had locked down at an earlier date? Uh, that is something that others have looked at, and, and there are other papers out there um, where it shows that, in, in the other papers, it shows that you would have reduced the number of infections and the cumulative deaths, and, and that all makes sense. Um, one thing that we added um, in here is, is that that's certainly uh, true, uh, even in our model, for the short term. Um, however, we look at the long term with these different lockdown and easing strategies and, and we show that any gains that you make um, can easily be lost if you don't have the proper testing and contact tracing program in place. Um, just, just as we showed with the, with the results I did show, um, if, if you're not on top of the disease, um, it will very quickly get out of hand. And, and I do want to thank uh, Michael Thorne, uh, a collaborator. Um, of both Laura and myself on a number of mathematical ecology uh, type works, um, but Michael and I uh, worked on on this particular epidemic model and um, the paper is down there at the bottom. Uh, if you if you want to find it, it's on the med archive uh, freely available. So that that was part one. Uh, and so now now part two um, is a bit different. So it's still still mathematical epidemiology. Um, but now, unlike 
<clears throat> part one, which was deterministic compartment modeling. Uh, now we want to look at uh, stochastic modeling. Um, and <clears throat> um, there's certainly a place uh, for deterministic modeling. Uh, we, just, we just went through a whole part one uh, showing the worth uh, of deterministic modeling. Uh, but there is, there is a feature to uh, deterministic modeling um, that misses uh, something important. Um, most, um, most deterministic compartment models have uh, two equilibrium, an extinct equilibrium and an endemic equilibrium. And for reproductive numbers that are greater than one, the endemic equilibrium is stable. Uh, this is a very common feature to, to these deterministic compartment models. But because it's stable, it means you never see an extinction of the disease, uh, even small perturbations away uh, from that stable endemic equilibrium, the, the state will just run back to uh, that endemic equilibrium. Uh, and you cannot make the disease go extinct or it doesn't go extinct on its own. Uh, however, in the real world, we often do see uh, extinctions of disease, uh, perhaps not global extinctions, that's, that's not being accomplished very often, um, but, but locally uh, diseases go extinct all the time. And, and it's just not captured, those local extinctions are just not captured by deterministic modeling. Uh, if you want to see it, you must include uh, stochasticity uh, into your modeling. And so, um, the types of problems that Laura and I have been working on uh, for a long time now uh, involve including uh, stochastic events uh, into these epidemic models and other systems. And we really are interested at, at looking at a few um, main features uh, that evolve from, from these modeling. Um, of course, the goal is, is to control and, and eradicate or make extinct uh, infectious diseases. Um, and there's also um, Laura will talk about later with an application to Ebola, um, we would like to understand how a population is vulnerable uh, to um, a new disease um, that, is, that is maintained within some kind of reservoir. Uh, for example, maybe a disease is maintained in a bat reservoir and on occasion uh, it comes into the human population like, like uh, with Ebola um, or even with, with this particular pandemic of COVID-19. Um, uh, sorry, can you go back, Laura? Um, so that's okay. Um, so, so extinction is a rare event. Uh, the figure on the bottom left, this is from a simple uh, susceptible uh, infectious and then, and then you're not immune to the, the disease but become resusceptible in SIS model. Uh, we see the number of infectious individuals fluctuating around the deterministic endemic state, but eventually if you wait long enough, it goes extinct. Uh, that, that is due entirely to the noise. That's a noise induced rare events or rare stochastic fluctuation. And some of the things that we're interested in is of all the different ways that you can go extinct, what's the way that is probabilistically most likely uh, to, to go extinct, you know, the so-called optimal path. Um, there's an example in the middle figure that Laura will talk about in detail later. Um, once you have that optimal path, you can find the expected or mean time to extinction and uh, also in the separate problem of uh, new disease in a population from a reservoir, uh, Laura will talk about that figure on the right uh, showing how to quantify different outbreak regions. So there's two broad classifications of noise, uh, external noise and internal noise. External noise comes from a source that's outside the system that you're studying. Its stochastic properties are given or, or known. Um, they are perhaps prescribed. Perhaps it's you saying, well, it's a Gaussian distribution with a particular mean and variance. And because of that, you can either turn it on or turn it off uh, as you so desire. Mathematically, we describe uh, these problems using a Langevin equation or the equivalent Fokker-Planck equation. And just a couple of examples. There's many, many examples from throughout the sciences and engineering, um, but two, two uh, uh, I think ones that are fairly understandable are you know, a random noisy signal that's fed into a transmission line, uh, or maybe a little bit more appropriate, uh, population growth of a species under the influence of the 
uh, external to the environment, the, the weather, or external to the, to the system, the weather conditions. Uh, on the other hand, internal noise is inherent in the system itself. And it's caused by the individual elements or particles or individuals that make up the system. Uh, you cannot turn it off. It's always there. Uh, mathematically, we use a master equation uh, that comes from uh, the microscopic equations of motion, uh, the individual interactions of the things that make up the system. And uh, two classical examples uh, would be chemical reactions, how individual molecules come together uh, to do different things, uh, or population dynamics, uh, how individuals come together or, or individual animals come together uh, to do certain things. Um, you know, maybe to, to be born or to die or to infect someone. These are the interactions uh, that we think about in, in, epidemi uh, in epidemiology. So to go through the, the um, stochastic problem formulation, um, we'll consider this uh, simple SIS uh, problem uh, because it's simple enough where we can do uh, all of the analysis um, without resorting to numerics. Uh, most problems, um, you cannot do that. Uh, in almost all these problems, you do have to resort to numerics at some point, uh, but this is a nice one because you really, I think, can understand what's happening um, uh, because of the capability of, of being able to do all the theory. Uh, so just to set the stage, um, so this is a, you know, you could think of this at this stage as a deterministic problem. The uh, population is divided into two compartments, susceptibles and infectious individuals. Um, one difference uh, between what we saw with the COVID-19 is now we include demography, uh, births and deaths. Uh, so in the first equation, we see the change of susceptibles. Uh, there is an influx of new susceptibles from birth. That's the mu n term. Uh, just as before, there's that uh, infection term uh, where individuals leave the susceptible class and move into the infectious compartment, uh, the beta SI divided by N. Um, uh, one difference now though is that uh, when you recover from the infection, you don't, you don't actually recover and become immune, you just become susceptible again. Uh, so you, you have the minus gamma I term in the infectious equation, that's the same, but you, they go back into the susceptible class. So in the S equation, we have a plus gamma I. And then there's individuals can die from both uh, compartments, the mu S and the mu I terms. Now under a constant population assumption where S plus I equals N, uh, we can write that 2D system as a 1D system just in, in I, um, that equation um, uh, that Laura's pointed to right now. Um, that, that equation has two steady states, uh, I equals zero, that's the extinct state, there's no disease. And then I equals N times one minus one divided by the reproductive number. That's the endemic state. That's the state where the disease is maintained in the population. And in this problem, the reproductive number has a simple form, beta divided by mu plus gamma. Um, as I mentioned, the endemic state is typically stable. And in this problem, it absolutely is stable for reproductive numbers greater than one. And we have the phase line uh, shown there at the bottom. So the left equilibrium is the extinct state. It's unstable. The right equilibrium is the endemic state and it's stable. And deterministically, if this was just considered as a deterministic problem, if you're at that stable equilibrium and something were to perturb you, back to, to the left or to the right of it, you just run back to that stable equilibrium. You cannot go extinct. Uh, so as I mentioned, in, in these deterministic problems, there's no path to extinction uh, that can occur. Um, but we're interested in capturing uh, extinction paths that we do see in the real world. And, and as I mentioned, we, we do that by including noise in, into the uh, problem. Uh, we can model stochastic population dynamics with a Markov process. Uh, that's just a random process where the future depends only on the present. It does not matter what's happened in the past. Uh, only happens where you are at today. And mathematically, we uh, study the change in the probability using the master equation shown here. The master equation is, is really just kind of a sort of a, a gain loss uh, type of equation 
where the term outlined in the purple is the gain to state x from uh, states around it, x minus r, and the term in, in the pink orange is the loss from state x to the other states around it. Um, here, rho is the probability of finding x number of individuals at a specific time, and those capital WRs are the transition rates um, from the different states, from state x to state x plus or minus r. Uh, the master equation captures all information uh, in the system probabilistically, um, but, but it's a complicated thing. So, so the master equation uh, is a large, or it can even be an infinite set of differential equations. Uh, only for the simplest equations can, can we solve the master equation analytically. And so this has led to uh, lots of approximations being used over the years. Uh, a diffusion approximation has often been used, uh, but it's been shown by a few individuals now uh, that it is uh, a very inaccurate approximation when trying to capture these noise-induced rare events, these extinction events. And so we will use a WKB, uh, Wenzel, Cromer's, Brillouin, uh, and also uh, sometimes Jeffrey's WKBJ approximation of, of this master equation. Uh, we'll step through the method in, uh, over the next couple of slides, but um, the method essentially transforms a stochastic problem into a deterministic problem of classical mechanics. Um, now that sounds nice, right? You've turned a stochastic problem into a deterministic problem, but there is a cost to it. And the cost is that you expand the size of your phase space that you're working in. Uh, if your original stochastic problem was associated with a n-dimensional mean field equation, once you go through this WKB process and transform the problem, uh, you've got a two n-dimensional set of equations. So that's the cost that you pay uh, for moving from a stochastic to a deterministic type of problem. It's very important uh, to understand that these new deterministic dynamics, uh, these are not the mean field dynamics of the original stochastic model. Um, there are additional dynamics included that are capturing processes not included in the original mean field dynamics. That's, that's that associated with the cost. When you expand to two n dimensional phase space, you're picking up new auxiliary dynamics that are associated with the noise processes. So just briefly to go through the, the technical uh, details here. Um, so for large populations, the extinction time is a rare event. It takes a long time uh, to happen. Uh, the system approaches a quasi-stationary state. So that left-hand term on the master equation, the change in rho with respect to time is approximately zero. Uh, so here we have the new master equation just written with the left-hand side uh, being zero. Uh, we expand the transition rates, the WRs, in terms of a large parameter, the system size n, uh, as shown uh, with, the, with the cursor arrow. And we scale the, the, uh, the number of individuals x uh, by that large system parameter n, uh, so we get a little x. And, and so at the bottom, we have a rescaled master equation. And on the next slide, um, we will apply the WKB approximation, uh, which goes like e to the minus ns, where n is that large system size parameter. And s is something called the action. Um, it's, it's borrowed, the terminology is borrowed from, from classical mechanics. Uh, we expand. Uh, all of these terms uh, in a, just a Taylor series expansion. We substitute all of this into the, mastery, the scaled master equation, and uh, we eliminate uh, all the high order stuff. And, and, and at leading order, uh, one finds a, a type of equation called the Hamilton-Jacobi equation that has an associated Hamiltonian that's shown here. This script H is the Hamiltonian in terms of the scaled transition rates, the little wrs, and in terms of a new variable p. So p uh, is this auxiliary variable that is associated with the expanded uh, two n dimensional phase space. And formally, it is the uh, derivative of the action uh, with respect to x. 
So given the Hamiltonian, we can differentiate it with respect to that new uh, auxiliary variable P and with the original variable X to find Hamilton's equations uh, as shown here. And, and here it's clear um, how you've got in the expanded phase space. So, so remember the original, uh, if we think about uh, the original SIS problem, we just had a 1D deterministic mean field problem, that I dot equation. But if we were to go through this formal theory, the WKB uh, approximation to the master equation for that problem, you would have one equation in I, and then you would have a second equation in P, where P is this new auxiliary variable that's capturing uh, the, the stochastic uh, aspects of the problem. Um, and in summary, uh, the WKB solution, um, what we're doing is finding a zero energy trajectory of the Hamiltonian of this effective mechanical system. So let's, let's do all of that work um, for the specific stochastic SIS model. Um, and, and we'll look at, at a picture of the topology and, and, I, and I think everything will make uh, a bit more sense when we, when we do that. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we have the SIS model uh, under the constant population assumption. Uh, we have the mean field equation as I dot is beta over N times N minus I times I minus gamma I minus mu I. So that's a 1D uh, mean field uh, equation. And, but I want to consider now the stochastic problem. Uh, and so now I look at the rates, the capital W's, uh, there's only three events that can happen in this problem. Uh, there is the infection event, um, and, and the term is given there. It's just as you see in the mean field uh, equation. Uh, we also have a, a recovery event, and we have uh, the death event. So those are the three uh, transition rates, and so that allows us to construct the master equation uh, shown at the bottom. And we go through that uh, that whole theory um, that I, I quickly went through. Um, so when you, when you do that, you find that the associated Hamiltonian for this stochastic SIS problem uh, is given uh, as shown uh, at the top. Uh, and again, because you've gone through this theory, you've, you've removed the stochastic aspects from the master equation. You've turned it into a deterministic problem, um, but you've expanded the phase space. So we see that this is a Hamiltonian in two dimensions the original I variable, as well as this new auxiliary P variable, um, that's the derivative of the action and is associated with the noise processes. The uh, zero energy solutions to the Hamiltonian uh, are shown on the second line. There's three of them, uh, I equals zero. That's an extinction line, uh, I is zero, uh, everything's extinct. Uh, P equals zero, that's the deterministic line. Uh, so P in general can be non-zero, but when it is zero, you're recovering the deterministic uh, situation. And then there's this third solution uh, given by the log of uh, the reproductive number times one minus I, and that turns out to be the optimal path. And, and we'll show um, the, the uh, graph of that in a, in a moment. Uh, from the Hamiltonian, we can take the derivatives with respect to P and I and get Hamilton. Hamilton's equations as shown here. So this is the expanded 2D phase space. Um, originally, the deterministic mean field, that was a 1D equation. Uh, going through the theory, we now have uh, a 2D uh, problem. Um, there are three equilibrium or steady states of Hamilton's equations. Uh, one of them is given by I equals zero and P equals zero. So I equals zero, it's still extinct. And P equals zero, that's deterministic. So that's associated with the original extinct state uh, from, from the mean field deterministic problem. Uh, there's also an endemic state where I is one minus one over the reproductive number, just as it was for the deterministic mean field equation. And P is equal to zero, designating that this is also a deterministic uh, solution. So that was uh, something that we had before as well. But now there's a new equilibrium that we didn't have. Um, it's extinct, I equals zero, but you see there is non-trivial P value. P is equal to minus log of R naught. 
so this is not something that was associated with the original deterministic problem. This is a new or so-called fluctuational extinct state. So here's the topology. So <clears throat> the horizontal axis is, uh, axis is I, and the vertical axis is that new auxiliary variable P. The top horizontal line, that's P equals zero. That's the deterministic line. And there's those two uh, endemic and extinction states in green and red. Those are on the deterministic line. Those were there in the original deterministic mean field problem. And they're still here in this expanded phase space. Uh, and again, if I only considered that deterministic line, there's no way to get from the endemic stable state to the extinct state in red, okay? But now I've got this expanded phase space and I've got a new extinction state, the fluctuational extinction state with non-trivial P. And I also have uh, that third zero energy solution to the Hamiltonian, the optimal path that connects the endemic state to the fluctuational extinct state. So I should mention that when you do the stability analysis for uh, these states uh, in this expanded state, these all become saddle points. And, and so now there's actually a way to leave the endemic state. Deterministically, there was no way to leave, but now that's become a saddle, there is a way to leave. And the way to leave is to follow uh, some path that will take you to the fluctuational extinct state, okay? Now, of all the possible paths that it can take, and there are infinitely many, there is one that is most likely to happen, and that's the optimal path that, that you see here. We can compute the action along the optimal path. Um, it's just the integral from the endemic state to that fluctuational extinct state, and P of I, that's, that is the optimal path equation that was on the previous slide. And we can do it analytically for this problem. And we get the log of R naught minus one plus one by R naught. And the reason we've done that is because that allows us to compute the mean time to extinction. Uh, it goes like E to the N times the action. Uh, and for the optimal action, we get the mean time to extinction. And again, uh, we can do uh, it uh, explicitly uh, for this simple problem. So, that, that gives you a broad overview of what we're doing uh, and hopefully uh, gives you a sense of, of what's happening. Uh, of course, there's a lot of detail that, that I've excluded. Um, and, and if you do want to see the detail, I would recommend you go to uh, a paper that I have with Richard Moore. Uh, it's a SIAM review paper um, that's really meant as a, as a primer to uh, understanding these types of, of problems. And, and here's a graph uh, just showing um, our theoretical result of the mean time to extinction versus reproductive number. Uh, the black curve, that's the theory. And uh, we're overlaying it with numerical results, uh, the circles. Uh, and we show great agreement between numerics and the theory for a wide range of reproductive number. And I'll just point out, it does break down for a low reproductive number. And that's because um, there was an assumption that I made at the very beginning, that quasi-stationary assumption that, that turned the, the rho dt term in the master equation to zero. Um, and so this only holds for quasi-stationary uh, situation. And where we see the breakdown in the result here, that's because the problem is no longer quasi-stationary. So the, the theory has broken down and we don't get good agreement. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, for a wide range of reproductive number. It is quasi-stationary and, and the theory is, is wonderful. Now there's many problems in, in epidemiology uh, where seasonal forcing is, is very important. Um, and so uh, Laura and I uh, wanted to add in uh, the seasonality. Uh, so in that contact rate beta, instead of it just being a constant value, now it varies sinusoidally in time um, and uh, much of what happens doesn't, doesn't change. Uh, uh, it's just that now things are varying in time. So the Hamiltonian uh, looks exactly as it did before, except now the beta is varying in time. Hamilton's equations are exactly the same as before, except again, now beta is varying in time. Uh, we still have the three uh, equilibrium of Hamilton's equations, extinct, endemic, and fluctuational extinct. 
Again, the only change is that the beta is now varying in time. Um, here, uh, we see the fluctuation of infectious individuals around the endemic state with a rare uh, extinction event occurring. Um, it's just as we showed before, except now the deterministic endemic state is this limit cycle in red, um, but still the fluctuations follow that, that limit cycle, um, very similar to what we saw before. And so Laura and I were interested in extending the WKB framework for these time dependent uh, types of models. Uh, so we assume the amplitude delta of the sinusoidal oscillation is much smaller than one. And that allows us to um, decompose the Hamiltonian into the original H0 Hamiltonian, what we had before uh, uh, for the non-time varying beta plus a time varying component uh, given by delta H1. Uh, and that's just what, what I say before. We have the unperturbed Hamiltonian H0 and the time dependent part H1. Now it turns out that um, under this perturbation, uh, those saddle points or hyperbolic points, uh, they will exist uh, due to poincare birkhoff fixed point theorem. And while that is a necessary condition for an optimal path to exist, it's not enough. Um, and so we have to do a little bit more to ensure that a perturbed optimal path does exist. And, and so to show this, um, we can assume that a perturbed optimal path does exist. And we can compute the action along the path, just as we did before. Uh, it's an integral um, of, of what you see here, except instead of minus H, it's minus H naught minus delta H1. We just see the decomposition there. And if we decompose the action as its unperturbed part uh, plus delta S uh, due to the perturbation, uh, we can find the change in action due to the perturbation uh, just through the integral of the delta H1 as shown. To find the optimal correction to the action, we differentiate the action just as you would do in, in, in uh, single variable calculus. And uh, we uh, find uh, this expression, this integral of the Poisson bracket between H0 and H1. We set it equal to zero just as you would in, in calculus. Um, and that integral of the Poisson bracket, that's called the Melnikov function for the perturbed problem. Now the, the Melnikov function says something about the distance between stable and unstable manifolds. So if, if you, have, you have an unstable manifold leaving the endemic state and you have a stable uh, manifold that's entering the extinction state, you, you don't want a situation where they miss each other. You, you want them to connect. And this Melnikov function tells you about this distance right here. And so uh, a sufficient condition for the existence of the perturbed optimal path is for the Melnikov function to have a simple zero. That's when that distance is zero and, and, the, and the manifolds will, will connect. And so on the next slide, um, it turns out that for the SIS model, the Melnikov function does have simple zeros and the perturbed optimal path does in fact exist. And so uh, if we go through the work and, and here we have to rely on numerics, uh, we can find uh, the optimal path as uh, shown here for the time varying uh, situation. Uh, these are two different numerical solutions and you see very good agreement um, and, and you see the fluctuations, um, the sinusoidal fluctuations within the optimal path. Uh, Laura and I uh, also looked at a more complicated SIR model. Uh, so here the deterministic mean field is 2D, which means when you go through the master equation WKB formalism, you end up with a 4D Hamiltonian and a set of four-dimensional Hamilton's equations. Um, but we can do the same theory. Uh, we do have to rely on numerics and, and the results are shown here uh, in two separate graphs, um, PS versus S and I, and then PI uh, versus S and I, where, where we have two of those auxiliary P variables now, PS and PI. Um, and the uh, red is the unperturbed problem uh, with a projection onto the SI plane, and the blue is the, the perturbed optimal path uh, where you see the, the oscillations um, due to the, the time dependence. And uh, again, I was a bit quick uh, through that, um, but all the details are in a paper that Laura and I have um, from a couple of years ago.
Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, so getting back to using stochastics in a real application, um, we wanted just to return very quickly to some of the work that we did on Ebola, um, just to show you that you can um, use this to get some, you know, qualitative again, um, maybe even in a way quantitative, but qualitative ideas of, of how, what, how risky it is for a introduction of a disease into a population. So we're going to start with the extinction idea and then we're going to flip over to the invasion. Uh, so this was uh, Ebola virus and due to the time, I'm not going to show the movie, but basically over uh, 2014 and 15, there was an outbreak of Ebola and I'm showing you here uh, the different countries in Africa where it, these were the confirmed cases the, the, at the end of the um, epidemic, which was uh, June 2016, they came up with these sums over time. What was interesting about this was that the, it wasn't just a wave. It was you know, a piece, you, know, you have a little outbreak here and it would spread a little bit and then it would jump and then have an outbreak over in another part of the country and another part. And they just kept going off like little, you know, popcorn type things. And so, um, you know, the, the basic gist is the fact that how can one predict the, that riskiness, you know, of an area that um, how things will pop up. So what we wanted to do here is, um, again, there is always value to that idea of the compartmental model as well, um, to figure out the dynamics of the system, to just get that flow so you can figure out where are the mitigation strategies, what would be the most impactful for uh, stopping or slowing the disease spread. And in this case here for Ebola, similar to what we saw before uh, with some of the COVID modeling, you have your you know, basic SEIR model. So you have susceptible, the exposed, the infectious, and the recovered. But in this case, it turned out that the hospitalized and the deceased were a major way that things were being spread, unfortunately. And so they have to actually be included as well in the dynamics. And so like before, we have natural death out of some of these populations and then the death from the disease and other ones. And, and it just follows a, a standard SEIR type of setup. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between Ebola and some of the others. Those random occurrences, okay, those, like I told you before, where the disease will pop up out of nowhere. Um, it could occur, of course, from human to human interaction, but you also have to have that introduction by the, um, an animal if, if jumping from one uh, species to another. And in this case, there is a belief of that this was bats. Um, and so you have what I call this, these little kind of stochastic sparks, okay? And that would take you from susceptible to an exposed. So that on top of the model is a very interesting dynamic that we wanted to study through the stochastic modeling. And, and you can see, and you bring this back, um, this animal transmission is a, a new category in a sense. And we use this kappa to say, what is that, the chances, those probabilistic, you know, the chances of this disease being introduced and how it jumps from one species to the other. But in general, the transmission from human to human, uh, you would have uh, the, the standard, the hospitalization folks. Uh, so you have someone who's infectious. Um, this is the, the S coming in, in contact with an I person. You can have actually from the, the local culture, um, the, from the death rites and the burial uh, traditions, you can have uh, people from the death uh, group transmit the disease to people, also from the hospitalized group. So you have these different types of, of betas for that contact uh, you know, rate. And so it's the those times the S, of course, and then in this case here, it's normalized by the total population. Um, and, and so instead of going through all of these uh, different groups, you can see there's many, many of them. I think there was, as we talked about before, you know, the more uh, population, sorry, the groups that you break this model into, the you know, higher the dimension of the system, um, you can see here you have a deterministic mean field. So let's start with that to start, you know, this, this kappa part here, we're gonna add in later and make sure that we look at that with the stochastic piece. But you can see one, two, three, four, five, six of these, these compartments. And if you make that kappa part be zero, you can go through and, and turn the crank, you're gonna have a disease-free equilibrium, of course, that means that 100% of the population is in the susceptible piece and everyone else doesn't have the disease, so we're okay. And then there's also a, um, you can algebraically find, it's complicated, I didn't put it here because too many terms, but it, there's an endemic equilibrium as well. And as you turn this guy up here, the kappa away from zero, things perturb, and it's a very interesting dynamic. 
So again, um, you can see that if we, we do think about what happens as we you know, look at this model, okay, under stochastic. So this is the, exactly the same machinery that Eric was presenting before, okay? You take this, you, you could do the WKB approximation, you turn the crank, you actually, at, instead of there only being an endemic, a stable endemic equilibrium, you've now actually figured out a way for this system to go extinct spontaneously. And you can predict that using the optimal path. So if you run this a zillion times, okay, so these are realizations that you can use with the Markov type of um, actually stochastic simulations, and you average over time, all the times it goes extinct. What I did here in this picture was I showed you just a slice, the susceptible versus the infectious. And so the red dot in the middle here is the endemic state. And you can see what happens is that as it goes through those realizations to extinct, it does that same type of spiral dynamic as I showed you before. And as it goes from the blue, which means um, very little, very few of those realizations go through those areas on on this projection. But as you get to the red, more and more of them, you can see it kind of follows that optimal path here. Okay, so you can visualize this, even though it's in, you know, whatever in this particular thing is seven dimensions. It's just a plain old simulation. But when you actually do the analysis of it, now it goes from six to 12. Okay, so when I said seven in the beginning, remember, they all add up to one, so you can get rid of one. So you have your six variables. And then you get your now your 12 dimensions and that you have to actually do that um, analysis for and you can numerically find the optimal path in those 12 dimensions projected on here and you can see it actually matches up with the standard simulations. And, and this is actually prehistories for 10,000 of these res, um, realizations and I'm using a population of, oops, sorry, it's down there, 10 to the seventh. So I wanted to show you another reason why we think this works, no matter how many dimensions you're in, um, because you can actually do a very standard center manifold analysis of it as well. And you can see that our optimal path lies on the center manifold as well, which is, of course, where you expect things to go, because center manifold means, of course, that things want to hang out there. All right. And so what we did was um, we did some very straightforward center manifold theory. And this is the analysis at the bottom here. This is a nice equation. I put that in this slice here of these three variables at the nice plane, and you can see how the projection of the optimal path lies on it. So that's just some, you know, basic uh, verification that this theory it really works. And now what we're going to do is, is turn up that kappa. We're going to say, all right, we're going to now have um, auto randomly the disease uh, introduced to the system with this variable kappa, which is kind of a I want to call the knob. I'm going to, I can turn that knob saying it happens um, very, very, it is very few times. Okay, so this is a 10 to the minus seventh. This is very small. And so you can have this way down here, very small, 10 to the minus seventh, or and I can turn it up here to six times 10 to the minus seventh. But the point again is this, this uh, random introduction makes a big difference. And you can plot um, all of these realizations. And so what I've done in this inset is sh I've shown you three specific ones. And you can see if it, the kappa is super small, maybe even 10 times to the negative 10th, uh, you get isolated outbreaks once in a while where that kind of burns through and then it dies out again, burns through and dies out. But they're very high in the number of people that they um, infect in that one outbreak. Um, as the kappa turns up, that means that you're introducing it more and more, you're going to see these happen more often not quite as isolated. And then of course you get down here when it's up here, it takes six times 10 to the minus seventh where it's actually happening in almost an endemic way. There's almost, you can see a, a little bit of white down here at the bottom in this time series where it's kind of, you know, uh, I'm gonna say oscillating around our endemic state. Um, but you can see as um, we look at, take a whole bunch of these realizations and average it over time, what is the proportion of the disease free time when it's truly at zero instead of during one of these outbreak events. When kappa is very small, you can see that there's a lot of time that it's disease-free. And as kappa increases, you're seeing that the disease is happening more and more often, which makes sense. Okay, so these are some of the things that you can get from these stochastic models. But what was most interesting to me was how do we compare this back to our mean field uh, theory? Uh, can we actually use that R0, R0, um, to tell us something about the system and how any of our intervention methods would, would uh, make a difference? So we took two parameters. We took the um, contact rate with the infectious group. Okay, so remember, that's the idea. You have to contact trace. You have to find that 
that person that's sick and put them, <laughs> isolate them, get them away from my susceptibles. And the other part is increasing the burial rate for the deceased. And, and that's changing culture. And changing culture in a society is, is very difficult. So this gets back to public health and how does one manage these things. But you can see, so that's the delta across the bottom. And then the beta, of course, on the left side here is the contact rate with the infectious. And what you want to do is get the, you want to increase the burial rate. So almost unintuitively, you want to go to the right more, okay, across the bottom. And then for this contact rate, of course, you want to bring that lower, lower, lower. That's flattening the curve, remember that. And as you would expect, again, this color here is the, the time between um, disease outbreaks. So you want it to be 98% disease free in my models, okay? And as you would expect, the green is in the bottom right corner where you're, you're putting the people, um, you're getting them away from uh, the susceptibles uh, quickly, okay, if they've deceased, and of course the contact rate in general with infectious is small. So down here it makes sense, you're doing a good job. But what we could do is go back to that actual, the mean fee field model and find out where the R0 is and how it changes, okay, theoretically from those, those equations. And you can see this dotted line here is exactly where it's one. That's that tipping point. Remember, in your mind, you're thinking, how many infections does one infectious cause, okay? So down here in the green, it's less than one. And then up here in the orange, it's more than one. That's when it's spreading again. And so you can see um, what you want is fewer I'm uh, sorry, sparse outbreaks, okay, is down in the bottom right. But when it is spreading quickly, you're seeing fewer disease-free periods. That's when it's becoming more endemic and that you can actually make a difference. And so this gives you a bit of a measure of, of how effective your mitigation strategies can be. And of course, that's what we've done here with the COVID-19. We said we need to decrease that contact rate and it really is effective. So just wanted to give you a quick example with the last couple of minutes here, showing that this actually can give you some insight to disease, even if it's not quantitative, it can be qualitative and make some sense to people on policymaking. Um, and that's what I'm talking about in the very beginning here. We have statistical pred predictions while simultaneously providing qualitative descriptions of system dynamics. Uh, we developed this foundational, um, this foundation for the analysis of these stochastic epidemiological models, which haven't been used uh, widespread because it, in the past it's been just a bunch of realizations and then we average over them. But now we can actually gather, so gain some insight from some analysis of them more theoretically. Uh, we've described some invasion dynamics. Uh, we decided uh, different outbreak zones um, and qualitative use of the traditional basic reproductive number in this case here. And then of course, uh, stochastic models can help quantify the impact of these intervention methods as that last graph was all about. So this was some work that was the culmination of a collaboration with one of our former doctoral students, Garrett Nidu, um, and then our two uh, colleagues over at the IBM Almaden Research Center. This is Simone Bianco and James Kaufman, and of course, Eric and I were on this as well, and we worked pretty hard, and we wanted to, with the last couple of seconds, thank you so much, Stefanella, for letting us tell you all about the, it's pretty long, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> I just, no, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's great. It's, uh, I have a lot to question, actually. I don't know. I maybe we should uh, set another time just to private the guy. <laughs> sure. very, very, very interesting, very interesting indeed. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, the reality in Brazil is very diversified. So a stochastic model, I think, will be very useful, you know, because we, we last week we had another very interesting talk about uh, a colleague uh, from Curitiba, Giovanni Vasconcello, and he did uh, um, a simple model, but he was showing how even the face, we are a totally different face within different towns, you know, like, you know, in one town we're still in the phase of, uh, in the growing phase, in another it seems saturation, but then as you relax, as you say, as we relax, like in Rio, we were doing fine, we were almost at saturation stage uh, with respect to death. Now they reopen all the beaches and everything and people uh, are not using masks and the curve is going up again. That's you right. know, yeah, unfortunately, I wish like, you know, Eric said, like we can do like this control where, you know, you can, okay, go back and do this and the back, but here it's hard, you know, because when people were locked down for it, because actually here we were locked down 
in a sort of lockdown for a long time. So, you know, since March, you know, because I think in the state you had, you know, June, you went back, but here it was sort of, so when now people are relieved, they, they all, uh, you know, okay, let's, uh, they, they want to go to nature, you know, they, they are used to have a close contact with nature that is actually good. So it's, it's hard to, once you open the door, <laughs> to close them again, you know, this is very hard, so. Oh, it is, um, and people get mask fatigue. There's all of these interesting, I watched my students, they started out so well the first week, and then they started wearing them, you know, down here, and then down here. Yes. <laughs> like, no, no, that's not how to wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, there are all sorts of things, but yeah, very interesting. I don't know if uh, I can have, uh, yeah, when you were showing that first, uh, uh, I think is uh, COVID, uh, I think, yes, yeah, the COVID uh, model, you, you were in the, your picture and the standard asymptomatic, they were going to recover. They were not dying of COVID, but, so, but then if you might revisit that, because then we know that there are side effects like cardiovascular, Things so people might not have recognized exactly like a COVID death, but actually it was in, caused by COVID somehow. You know, like so, you will not consider uh, adding death of a symptomatic in that model that you show at the beginning. I think I'll yeah. defer to Eric on that. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's a. I mean, it's a very good point um, that. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, one, one thing is, is that, you know, it seems like every day that goes by, we learn something new. Um, and, and so at the time that, that Michael and I had worked on this, um, you know, it, it seemed like asymptomatics were, were for the most part fine. And, and that's why we made that decision. But, but I, I think the point's very well taken that, that, you know, the model uh, could be and should be um, updated to take into account some some of these newer information. That's that's one way uh, that could happen. Yeah, uh, there's that, certainly yeah, there's certainly some other things you know that that may be very relevant as well. I mean, it's I think it's still not at all clear about reinfection. Um, you know, we've seen yeah. we've seen a few instances of reinfection. It's not maybe those are extreme outliers, and we don't really need to take into account. But but maybe it's the start of of something that we do need to consider and. And of, of course, there's some things like, uh, you know, there are some mutations. Um, that's, that's something that, that perhaps uh, is, is worse. So, yeah, I, I agree. Um, it, it, you know, the model uh, can and, and should be uh, updated as time goes on. Yeah, because also all your parameters are constant. And maybe that could, uh, could take into account some of this. Uh, for example, one thing, actually, we'd like to talk to you because one thing we, uh, we, we were considering also the fact that of the system of the hospital has some other fatigue, you know, at least in Rio, we, in Rio, the, the, our public hospital didn't receive testing or a lot of uh, equipment. So we had excellent doctors on staging, but they were lacking for a long time of the necessary equipment. So doctors were getting infected, nurses were getting infected, and we had the highest, uh, we have a very high rate of death uh, among these people. So uh, we had the fatigue yeah. of the hospital system that got the saturation. So even when you had the lower of, uh, of uh, people from outside, you have uh, less personnel in it, less, uh, to be able to assist new newcomers, so uh, that was another phase, you know. So, right. Right. Yeah. So, so you had yeah. the, the, the you have the initial grown up, but then you have the critical hospital uh, phase. Yeah. So it's hard from the model to distinguish between you know the increasing and the fatigue. I, I call it yeah. the fatigue of the hospital. Yeah. So that's that's exact that's exactly right. Um, it's something that we we discussed this this exact point actually, um, and and we attempted to include it in the early days. Um, and the reason we chose not to is because this whole this whole model is parameterized based on empirical data for New Jersey. Yeah, we didn't have the data for that, yeah. um, and so so because we had no empirical data, we thought well you know it's it's 
let's uh, let's just let's leave it out at this stage. You know, perhaps we'll we'll get that data in the future. Um, you know, it's I mean, it's a it's a good thing. You know, Laura has mentioned a couple times that you know these these results are qualitative. Yeah. Um, no, no, you know, no. Even, they're even, great. No, I, they're great. Yeah, I'm yeah, just no, no, saying. No, no. Yeah. We've no, no, talked I, about I, something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, but I think it's, I think it's a, a well worth saying that you know I included a table that has quantitative numbers in it, um, but that, you know, it that's not the point, right? The point is not those specific numbers. The yeah. the point is to get a qualitative sense of yes. of what's so, what's happening, um, and and uh, yeah, no, I think you know. I mean, associated with that, you know, we, we do have parameter values um, as, as best we have uh, from New Jersey and, and also from Europe in a couple of cases uh, for some of the disease specific parameters. But, but, you know, they change as time goes on and, and there's still uncertainty on some of these parameters. So um, pr particularly uh, this sort of fraction of, of individuals who are asymptomatic um, in, in the early days when we were putting the model together, it was ranging from 20 to 80%. Um, yes. And I, I, think, I think we used around 35%, 40%, yes. something like that. So, so you know, I think we, we you, know, you know, a little bit by chance sort of, you know, have it probably right, but uh, we're close to right. But yeah, I mean, it's, these, it, the importance is more the qualitative nature of these, yeah, not, of not the actual numbers. So. Yeah, maybe, maybe one time we, we, we start to play with the model very, very close to you um, with Pedro Maria. Maybe we can show you some result and maybe, you know, it would be good <laughs> yeah, maybe to, to cross yeah. the thing. Another thing that I want to mention, of course, here is different reality, but we've been observed that after uh, the continuous, because it's not and the, the first wave of COVID, we have another tuberculosis wave going on. And so uh, even locally, you know, some people in some community, I know that in some family that got COVID, then now they're gotten tuberculosis. Do, do, you, do you have any in the States, any other occurrence of some apparently relate relations uh, or other it facilitate or not the spreading of some other disease there? Did, did you observe? I've, I've not seen anything myself. Um, I know there's, there's certainly a lot of concern uh, coming uh, with influenza uh, mm -hmm. throughout the winter. Um, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a massive campaign going on right now to, to try to get everybody or as many people as possible to get the, the flu vaccine. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I don't, I have not heard of anything, uh, you know, that's happened uh, through the past six months or so. Oh, okay. And uh, well, the, the other part is um, more than a disease spread situation. It's just the fact that people are not going to the hospital as yes. much for yes. anything. I mean, yeah. even if it's a heart attack, <laughs> they're not going. Yeah. And it's a very bad thing for people in general to let their, whatever their maladies are, um, go unchecked. And so it's a problem. Yes, and, and here we have that 25% of the population, this was a study actually from Phil Cruz, uh, as a private, uh, can afford to have private health care. It's not that we are comparing the private is better than the public. And uh, we just, we, as we say, we have excellent uh, public hospital, but they are reduced. They can support the 75% of the remaining uh, population. This is the question of number, capac capacity. And when we look, uh, we did the, actually, this is a group is a task force of UFRJ, there is Roberto Medronio and Guilherme Travis that there after this, they look at the occupancy of the hospital during the middle of the pandemic. You have that the curve of occupancy of the private hospital is almost full and the percentage of people going to a public hospital is lower. And you can imagine that the 75% of the remaining population is less in real number than the 25%. You see, so what's going on with the rest of the 75%? So we have a, a, a large fraction of the population in the favelas that didn't look for a doctor. So this is why we were thinking that telemedicine was very important to at least provide the first aid. You know, like, you know, we had a very courageous uh, doctor, at least in OFRJ, that it was very much available whenever I call, oh, you know, there is someone in the favela. And 
he was good because he had the procedure of question to call people to ask questions to at least try to figure out if the person was a suspect case or not but of course even in this framework uh, at a certain point the person needs to take a, a minimum of a, a medical measure you know like what about the oxygen in your blood and then you are facing the fact that even if there is a clinic nearby maybe that specific equipment that is not very expensive is missing so you know so we find out that if there is a minimum of infrastructure, at least we could be a big, uh, uh, we could improve this lack of, uh, you know, basic assistance, the first aid. Uh, so we, uh, yes, I think that the Brazilian number are still very much under report because of, of this problem. You know, yeah, people do not go to the doctor. You know, people, some fraction of the people are not used to go to the doctor, even in, usual situation and now you know even the people that were going to the doctor are not going so yeah so we're facing this yeah okay so very much great so i'm just saying i think people are intimidating because it was so good <laughs> i'm just uh, I, I think yeah i think it's very very impressive about how we could implement things stochastically this is your model every time i see it is very impressive so looking forward to to read more in detail and if we can set up another you know personal meeting because i can show you some model that we were doing with pedro and then you know being the two of us and he's starting a new job in texas you know it's good if some other you know i, I think that things would speed up eh? if we show you <laughs> fantastic we'd love That's to great. see what you're up to and, and yeah yeah back, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, at least to, you know, to finish up, you know, because uh, we started, it was good. And then, you know, we need more uh, experience uh, view on, on, the, on it. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much to both, you know, like uh, to people, uh, to people got really, get really uh, timid in English, you know, sometimes yeah, we, we like people speaking Portuguese with the beginning, but, uh, you know, I'm sure that everyone really appreciate it was Armando. Maybe Armando wants to say a word. Well, I, I liked your talk very much. I am interested in stochastics, in stochastic models for population dynamics and also epidemics, but I'm still starting my work on epidemics. So I really have nothing to say unless that I will read your papers. Yeah, we will study together. We can do a, a working group. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, Laura Armando is from Belo Horizonte. Uh, you you didn't go there in your traveling, but is is another possible is another big university, federal university there, and there is an excellent group actually even in uh, probability and stochastic. So um yeah yeah there are some very very good colleagues there. So next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next time, next time. It, it, it's it's a nice town. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's very natural, full of natural resources and so on. So I'm sure that in the next visit it will be very good. Uh, another thing, but no. It, now we we're trying to, with Armando to establish a collaboration in this virtual world. So maybe yeah. this will be. I do have one question for you. Um, so you yeah. talked about TB a minute ago. So there are other diseases. So when I was there last time, there was a lot of talk about Zika and dengue and um, you know other types of uh, vector-borne yes. diseases. Have you noticed because the people are staying in uh, that there, those numbers have stayed low? Is there any other? Look, know? I didn't. I have to confess it. I didn't look so much, but apparently the number uh, reported uh, that I heard, but I haven't looked up to confess. Uh, we were expecting dengue, uh, usual dengue. Uh, Zika is not so much now since uh, the last time, and chikungunya uh, and and uh, yellow fever. You know, we have <laughs> we have all the spectra. But uh, what seems that was circulating was a uh, uh, N one H one. You know, like it was uh, blue. Yes, it was it was circulating in Amazonia. In Amazonia, it was circulated at the same time in uh, March. COVID, 
tuberculosis, H1N1, mm -hmm. and also Rio, it got here. And we, I haven't heard so much, maybe, uh, uh, what's her name? Um, Renata can, can comment on this. We haven't, uh, I don't know if we, because we, we didn't look, but we haven't heard so much about uh, dengue case, like expected. Usually March and April are the usual um, um, month, you know, because we have the rains and so we expect, but we haven't heard. And as you say, who knows is because maybe people pay more attention, you know, th these things about the washing and there's more focus about the, uh, uh, stay good. So uh, we know that, for example, if you want to know some uh, curious uh, statistic, if you look about the region, I heard uh, recently someone talking about some uh, research about the zone of control. If you look at the zone of control, of, uh, of control meaning uh, who is taking charge really, is where the state uh, police or the militia or the narco traffic uh, uh, people, in which area there was less COVID was in the narco traffic area because <laughs> they didn't want to have problem, they want to stay good. So they kept sure the people that were not having contact. Wow. So, yes, we had some, yes. So uh, the state, Apparently, where the state was was in the middle, in the middle, and then apparently some of the militia zone uh, were highest of COVID because mm -hmm. they 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 had an interest that that the shop were open because they are taking some percentage on that. So, yeah, so we had some interesting social dynamics <laughs> here yeah. Yeah. Yeah, about this. Yeah, but yes, but uh, we want to go back to take uh, Dengue because actually Dengue, we had the project about Dengue last, last time and thanks to Sarah, we ha she gave us all this, um, this data about all the municipality Rio that now we know uh, of Brazil. And there were some interesting uh, patterns uh, that also we can maybe we can talk and we can uh, definitely that's very yeah, yeah that 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 reminds me a lot about the first part of your talk yeah, about yeah. these different ways definitely uh, we observe something very on that lane uh, on what you were saying at the beginning of your talk so this park also uh, alight so many things to talk about <laughs> all right yeah, 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 that's definitely good. So thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, Marcel, Nelson McLean uh, has to leave, say thank you. So thank you, Nelson, to be there as usual. And thank you to you too. So definitely we should uh, make uh, another personal meeting to discuss the, maybe next week or in the next two weeks will be great. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Okay, thank you very much. And your paper, you say, all these paper you mentioned in your talk are on your web page or everything? Yes, they are. Yes. Yeah, okay. So we'll find it because we we'll, we'll like to make a, a true study of that. Uh, the, only, the only one that's not on my web page is the, the COVID model, which is on the Med Archive. Uh, could you possibly send it to me? Is it yes. possible? Yes. yes. Thank you. That would we'll be. What the references and make sure they're all there for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I'm uh, sometimes jumping from one archive to the other, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No that loss in how I remind how to get things, but maybe yeah. we just click, it's easy. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll send it all. all right. Okay. So thank you again. This thank you very much. Thank, yes, you. thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.